We'll start with uh, posture and positioning and how to hold the scope. For the most part, we want to have a, a firm, upright posture. Uh, regardless of your handedness, whether you're right-handed or left-handed, the scope itself uh, goes into your left hand. There are alternate ways to hold the scope. Some people do hold it in their right hand, but for the most part, the vast majority of people will hold the scope in their uh, left hand. Uh, I like to have the umbilical cable on the inside part of my wrist. There's certainly no mandate to do that, but for me, this is the most comfortable way to hold the scope. That then lets me have my right hand to hold the distal portion of the insertion tube. Uh, that allows me to do some of the motions we're going to show you in a minute, including advancement and retraction of the scope, as well as to provide some of the torque maneuvers. Uh, on our endoscope itself are, are several uh, accessories. Um, we have, uh, we, this is the control section of the scope. We have two wheels. Uh, one of the wheels, the smaller of the two, works the endoscope tip in terms of left and right positioning. The larger of the wheels works the up and down positioning. Um, for the most part, when I'm doing endoscopy, I will use my left thumb to work the up-down wheel. Uh, on occasion, I will take my right hand off of the insertion tube and use the left-right wheel. My hands are actually big enough, though, that I can actually reach around the front or the back of the scope to do small adjustments of the little wheel. Not everybody's hands are able to do that. People with smaller hands, um, many females can't reach their hands around to do it, and you may have to use your right hand to do some of the, the, the minor adjustments of the, of the wheels. Each of the wheels has a, a lock. I don't like to use the term lock because a lock implies that once it's set, things can't be moved. This is more of a, a break. There's a letter F. I tell folks that F stands for free, and free is forward. That means the wheel spins very freely and easily. The problem with it, as you can see, is that there's drift. When you turn the wheel, if the brake is not on, if the wheel is free, it will slowly creep back toward a neutral position. When I do endoscopy the way that I was trained, I like to have the brake on the little wheel. So back, the brake is set. When you turn the wheel and do a minor position, the wheel will not move. That then lets you have your right hand off of the wheel, you can focus on big wheel motions, and you can use your right hand to then do scope insertion maneuvers. There is also a brake on the big wheel. Free is forward, back is brake, it's exactly the same. On the modules where we're doing a therapeutic maneuver, such as a polypectomy, or using an instrument in our instrument channel here, I will commonly put both brakes on, so that when I turn the wheel and set the endoscope tip position, the scope will not move. I can then focus my attention on very minor torque with my hand and focus on working on my instrument uh, positions in and out. Again, those are not mandatory, but there are, def there are definitely things that I find uh, beneficial in endoscopy. On the rest of the control knob are several other buttons. We have a button that allows us to insufflate air, which is the bottom button, and also wash the lens. Now, the way this works is if you have your finger over the button without any pressure, just over it, you are then insufflating air through the endoscope. This is one of the big differences between the simulator and using an endoscope uh, clinically, which is you won't feel any air coming over the tip here. So one of the things to be aware of when you're doing endoscopy with the simulator is that if you have your finger over here, you are insufflating and you may not get any tactile feedback to know that you're insufflating. And so as you're learning to use the simulator, you need to pay attention to the degree of pain that the patient is in on the screen and the amount of insufflation that you're doing. To stop insufflating, simply remove your finger from the button. If your screen is dirty, if the lens tip is dirty and you want to wash it, you depress the bottom button. You'll hold it in and you'll feel a little click and that will wash the screen. Um, that works the same in, a, in an actual endoscope as it does here in the simulator. The top button is for suction. You depress the top button and that, that provides suction. You can hold it in. You can also uh, tap it. You can also work two-handed. You can suck and insufflate simultaneously. If you're underwater and you want to clear a puddle, you can suck, but if you don't want to lose any insufflation air, you can tap the air button simultaneously. The rest of the buttons up top here are to take pictures. On most commercial endoscopes, they can be programmed to do really whatever you want them to do. Uh, for the most part, the thumb button back here, which is very close to your thumb, so your thumb will work the big wheel, and when you want to take a picture, you can simply transition that over to capture a picture. So now we're going to focus on um, some of the basic scope uh, maneuvers in terms of insertion, 
using the left, right, and up, down wheels and, and work on torque. Uh, we're going to use our uh, simulator here. Um, we want to hold, again, this is the insertion tube. We want to hold the insertion tube with our right hand to insert the scope. We'll keep it in a neutral position going in, and we'll insert the scope. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn and face so you can see what I'm doing here. Um, for the most part, we would want to stand facing our, our endoscope screen. That's a very ergonomic view looking directly across yourself uh, at the video. So here we are in a colon, and you can see that my screen is already a little bit dirty. So I'm going to use my wash button to wash the lens as we talked about a few minutes ago. And now I've got a very nice clean view. Now there are a lot of motions that we can do here with the scope. And I'm going to start with the easiest ones, which is uh, with my right hand. And that will involve uh, simple torque. By simply taking my hand and torquing clockwise and counterclockwise, we can see that our image moves clockwise and counterclockwise on the screen. Now, torque doesn't always translate into one-to-one -one motion. If you have a large loop in the scope and you're trying to torque with your left hand, that loop will absorb a lot of the energy of the torque. And you might not see as much motion on the screen as if you're torquing with your right hand very close and there's no loop involved. So we want to be careful and pay attention to how we're doing the torque. Many times you don't have the ability to have your hand on the insertion tube here to provide the torque. And in those circumstances, if I'm doing a very fine maneuver or I have my hand on the uh, small wheel or I'm working an instrument, that torque is going to be done with my left hand. And again, on the screen, you can see that while I'm torquing a, a large amount here, the image is not moving very much on the screen. If I take a step back and make as straight a line as possible, I can make that torque work a bit better. The more of the scope that is in the patient, or for upper endoscopy where the scope is simply shorter in general, the torque translates in a one-to-one -one motion much better. So there are two ways to torque. You can torque with the left hand. You can torque with your right hand directly on the insertion tube. The right hand works in and out. So you can work in and out motions with the right hand. Again, there are times where the scope you know, may want to migrate back from position, meaning that there is some uh, looping of the scope or there is some peristaltic motion that continually moves the scope back. And you may find yourself in a position where you need essentially three hands to do the maneuver that you're trying to do. You, you, when you take your hand off the insertion tube, the scope is moving, but at the same time, you need to get back here to the control knob to, to do, a, to do a, a maneuver. In those circumstances, you can do one of several things. You could have an assistant hold the insertion tube, or you can actually work three-handed, and here's how we do this. We're gonna use our, our pinky and our little finger on the left hand here, and we're gonna loop the scope into our hand, and that will hold the scope in position. I can then use my right hand to work the little wheel, and I can use my thumb to work the big wheel. And with this hand, I can provide a measure of in and outward motion and a little bit of torque while at the same time having my hands on the control knob. Now, you can see that to do this, I'm a bit hunched over, and this is an uncomfortable position, so you wouldn't want to be here for very long. But for very difficult scope maneuvers or for tight position working, this is a great way to work three-handed. The rest of the maneuvers um, are done with, with the left hand in general. And so on the screen, we're going to see that if I center this, thumb down on the big wheel looks up, thumb up on the big wheel, or index or ring finger on the wheel makes it go down. Now, if you ever forget the motions, you can always look. And they are actually marked here in terms of which direction they move. So it says D is that direction. So up on the big wheel, goes down. For the little wheel, up on the little wheel looks right. So on the screen, there's right, there's left, there's up, and there's down. Okay. So again, to repeat those motions, when I use my thumb and I go down on the big wheel, that looks up. When I go up on the big wheel, that looks down. When I go away with the little wheel, that looks right. When I turn towards with the big wheel, that goes left. And these are the motions that you want to automate. These are the motions that when you come to a turn, you don't want to have to stop and think about which direction is going to get me in that position. You, these are the automated motions that you want to have. So navigating through the colon or through the upper GI tract then becomes a combination of using these motions. Left, right, up, down, in and out, 
and torque. And those are your motions that allow you then to navigate. So we can do a little bit of navigation here and I'll sort of talk my way through it. So I'm going to advance the scope in. I'm going to now try and keep that lumen centered. And so I'm going to look a little bit toward the left, which is going down on my little wheel. And I'm going to go up on my big wheel, which makes me look down and now I'm centered. And now I can advance in a small amount. These systems are not static. As patients breathe and as they move and as peristalsis happens, um, you need to be able to dynamically change. And so these are um, small motions as we go forward um, to keep ourselves in position here. I'm going to open my hand up here so you can see the very fine motions I'm doing on the endoscope tip to navigate through here. So I'm navigating. That's a little bit of torque. It's a little bit of thumb down. I'm advancing in more thumb down on the big wheel. I'm going to try and torque, but I can't quite torque. And so this is a spot where I may have to use my little wheel. And so I can actually reach around here with my fingers and I can use my little wheel like that to reach over. But if I couldn't do that, I would have to let go of the scope here, reach my opposite hand up and turn that back in the direction that I want. And those are both acceptable maneuvers to do. Again, if your hand is big enough and you can reach around like I just did, that's probably the preferable maneuver. Again, you can see that I'm going to torque and get this in position. For uh, almost all endoscopes, the thumb down position, which is a very easy maneuver to do, actually lets the scope bend uh, more and lets the scope go into more than a 90 degree bend. And so as we come to bends in the colon, one of the things you may want to consider doing is as we come to a bend, if I torque, I can then do a very easy thumb down maneuver. So if you put the lumen or the angle that you want to go into the 12 o'clock position on the screen, the next motion you have to do is a simple thumb down maneuver to center yourself back on the screen. But here we go, we're navigating some more. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm using torque aggressively here to position myself on the screen. Most of this I've been able to do really with very minimal insufflation and with very minimal uh, use of the left right wheel. So here's, here's, an, here's an opportunity where I have two options. I can use my little wheel and I can turn it away from myself to look right around the bend. That's one option. Let's go back and let's show you the other option, which is to identify which way that bend is going to go. I know it's over here and I'm going to torque to put that bend towards the 12 o'clock position. I'll go thumb down on the big wheel and that is once again put the lumen back in the center of my screen. That will then allow me to, uh, to advance in. As you're getting used to doing this, it's important that we, you know, you use relatively small, small motions of the endoscope tip. Lar large motions generally will wind up with you looking at the, at the wall and you may, if you do it fast enough, clinically, you may, you may miss the fact that the lumen is actually down as you're going left and right. If at any point you are lost, if you cannot see the lumen, you should not advance the scope. In that circumstance, you want to back out. In general, in endoscopy, back is the position of safety. That lets you then do small motions of the wheel tip to find the lumen. In general, a blind advancement is not advisable, although there are certain circumstances where it is a necessary maneuver. But they, again, that's something you should only do if you understand how a blind slide should feel in the circumstances where you might use it. Otherwise, you are increasing the risk of a potential perforation. All right, so now we're gonna spend a few minutes and talk about guidelines for a safe and effective endoscopic evaluation. And there are some general rules that apply to all endoscopy, whether it's upper or lower endoscopy. Uh, for the most part, we wanna make sure that as we're going through a lumen, that we keep the lumen uh, in the center of the screen. And this is valuable for several reasons. Number one, the goal of endoscopy is to evaluate for mucosally based pathology for almost all of the diseases that we're treating. Uh, so we want to get a good evaluation of the mucosa. Number two, we want to do endoscopy safely. And when you can't see the endoscope tip and you're advancing the scope, we risk a perforation. And by keeping the lumen in the center, we reduce the risk of an endoscope perforation with the tip of the endoscope. As we're advancing forward, it's important to get a good sense and an understanding of how much force is being put on the scope. There are certain places in the GI tract where you need to apply more force in order to uh, 
allow the scope to advance forward. Uh, and so clinically, as you become more advanced in doing endoscopy, you get a better sense of exactly how much force you are applying uh, and how much force you can apply in certain areas. Uh, among the places where we typically need to apply a little more force is as we go through the sigmoid colon, the sigmoid colon is not fixed in the retroperitoneum and it tends to advance forward with the scope and that allows us to build a large loop. Uh, for the most part, as we're going through loops, we need to use a bit more force to allow the scope to advance through the distal part of the loop, and then uh, we do a loop reduction maneuver, which we will show you here as we go through. Uh, loop reduction maneuvers allow the endoscope to shorten inside the GI tract, allow the scope to then advance with substantially less force. But having an understanding of how much force you're applying is important, because while keeping the lumen centered on the screen is very important, Behind you, along the insertion tube of the scope, you are applying force, and you can damage or injure the colon or the upper GI tract by applying force in an area where you are not able to physically see that you're doing it. This is happening behind the scope in an area that you can't see. Let's do some basic scope navigation here uh, through the upper. I'm sorry, through the colon model that we're working on. Uh, again, we're going to use uh, uh, several ways to keep the lumen centered. Uh, we can use our left-right wheel to turn through these areas to keep the lumen centered as we advance. S slow motions in either direction uh, as, as we move forward. I'm here showing you how you might take your hand off the insertion tube to go to the small wheel to do some of those motions. I can also do it by simply using my thumb or my uh, index finger on the opposite side to do some of those motions. And again, the third option would be to torque the scope so that the bend that I want to go around is in the up-down position so that I can simply use my thumb button uh, on the end of my thumb on the big wheel to do a very simple and very easy maneuver to keep the lumen centered. So here's an option. Instead of using my left right wheel, I'm going to torque a small amount. That'll keep the lumen centered and that will allow me then to advance. So we're going to keep that lumen centered as we go through. For a colonoscopic evaluation, on the way in, we are not doing the majority of our inspection. You will certainly see and identify lesions on the way in. If you do, it's important to mark where they are. To be effective, endoscopy needs to be uh, annotated and uh, data collected for uh, the patient's medical record. And so that means that when you find pathology or you find an area of concern uh, or you find an important anatomic landmark, you wanna make sure you capture that with a picture. So as we're advancing around our colon here, uh, we are going to eventually get to the cecum. We're going to see the appendiceal orifice and the terminal ilium at the ileocecal valve. And those are important landmarks for us to document that we have identified so that we can say that we have done a complete colonoscopy. And so here we are at a location where this is where the colon ends. This appears to be the appendiceal orifice. And if I back out, I can see the ileocecal valve. The ileocecal valve is right there at the 12 o'clock position on the screen. And so we would want to capture a picture of this. So there are a few maneuvers uh, with the endoscope that we would uh, consider unsafe. Uh, in the colon, the uh, only place we would normally want to retroflex would be in the rectum to look at the uh, anal canal uh, and the very distal rectum. Uh, the remainder of the time, we do not want to retroflex in the colon uh, unless you are an expert and are doing it for a particular reason. So an unsafe maneuver to do in the colon would be if we are trying to uh, better evaluate the appendiceal, I'm sorry, the uh, ileocecal valve, would be for me to do a full thumb down maneuver or a, a full down turn of the big wheel to retroflex. If you see the colon, if you see the endoscope like this in the colon, you have turned the scope tip too far. The, the way to undo this is to put your wheels, if you have your wheels locked, put your wheels into a free position let them slowly turn back toward neutral, and then I very slowly will withdraw the scope as I turn that big wheel back to a more neutral position. Uh, that is the way to reduce uh, that, that scope tip deflection. Um, that's probably the, the most important unsafe maneuver. The other things that we would not want you to do, as I said earlier, there are some, some certain circumstances where you cannot make the scope tip see the lumen as you're going around. And one of the examples would be at the junction of the descending colon and the sigmoid colon, where you may have to do a very short blind slide. 
I would recommend that you do that only after you have an understanding of how much force you can apply. And if you are doing a blind slide, as you're doing it, you need to make sure that the mucosa that you're evaluating is sliding along with the scope tip the entire time. If the mucosa is not moving and you are applying force, you are risking making a perforation with the scope tip. So here you can see I've blinded myself intentionally. And as I'm sliding out and as I slide in, the mucosa is moving with me in a one-to-one -one fashion. I'm not applying a lot of force. I would say that this is a relatively unsafe maneuver, and the more uh, safe maneuver would be to simply look into the lumen and then advance the scope. All right, so now we're going to focus on uh, mucosal evaluation. Uh, this is a colonoscopy model that we're working in right now. Uh, I've already advanced the scope using safe advancement maneuvers, and we're looking at the appendiceal orifice. And so we have reached the end of the colon. Uh, along the way, we want to capture pictures to document important findings. And so for a colonoscopy to be complete, we need to reach the appendiceal orifice. We need to identify that and we would capture a picture. I'm going to show you one of the uh, advantages here of the simulator, which is that we can go to a map view and show ourselves uh, where we are, uh, where we are in the colon here. So you can see we've started distally here at the rectum. We've advanced all the way through the sigmoid colon. You can see this is a very straight advancement through the sigmoid colon. We don't have a large loop. Our scope goes around uh, the descending colon, around the splenic flexure, across the transverse colon, around the hepatic flexure, and down. Uh, we see the cecum here, which is where I, my scope tip is currently located, as well as the appendice, the uh, terminal ilium here. Let's go back now to our endoscopic view here. So. Uh, important things uh, with withdrawal of the scope uh, is to follow standard guidelines for scope withdrawal. Uh, we want to evaluate uh, the entire surface of the mucosa. We want to have an acceptable withdrawal time, keeping in, in line with standard guidelines for withdrawal and uh, complete colonoscopy. And again, we want to document any findings with a video and pertinent findings such as polyps that can be removed, we would remove on withdrawal. So we're going to bring the scope back here, and we're going to simply focus on maneuvers right now to provide a complete mucosal evaluation. So just like advancing the scope, keeping the scope tip in the center of the lumen is probably the most important thing in terms of the ability to identify pathology. We also need to remember that this is a very dynamic system. The colon is going to move with peristalsis. The patient is going to be breathing or potentially moving uh, on the table, and so the colon is going to move. There may be areas of the colon that are not as well prepped as others, and there may be fluid that we need to either irrigate to thin out and ultimately to suck and evacuate to allow us to have a complete mucosal evaluation. We also have postural folds that we need to work around. And one of the areas where polyps are commonly missed is on the backside of haustral folds. So over this ridge here is a haustral fold, and we would need to make sure that as we look that we aren't missing polyps on the backside of the haustral folds. So keeping the lumen insufflated while we do this to distend the colon up allows us to have as flat of haustral folds as possible and to see around them. Areas that are commonly missed when we're looking for pathology include areas of the colon like the hepatic flexure, the splenic flexure, and at the sigmoid colon where there are natural bends in the colon. The ability to evaluate the inside bend of all of these, so the inside turn here and here and the inside turn on the sigmoid as we get down to it, are areas that are harder to evaluate. And that may require you to advance the scope past that area a second time, torque to a different position, and withdraw the scope to assure that you've seen all of the mucosa in that area. So we'll start our scope withdrawal. Again, I'm going to keep my hand on the insertion tube here as I do this withdrawal. If we have a loop and the re loop reduces quickly, we will see the colon fall back very fast. And if that happens as you're reducing the scope, it's important that you take your insertion tube and simply move forward a small amount. And by moving forward a small amount, that will hopefully keep that loop from reducing substantially and you from losing a very large distance of advancement and incompletely evaluating a large segment of the colon. Uh, this is a colonoscopy model that we're working in right now. Uh, I've already advanced the scope using safe advancement maneuvers and we're looking at the appendiceal orifice. And so 
we have reached the end of the colon. So we'll start our scope withdrawal. Again, I'm going to keep my hand on the insertion tube here as I do this withdrawal. And as I do this, I'm going to use my wheels to look up and down. I'm going to use torque, and I'll use right and left to assure that we are completely evaluating all of the areas of the colon. And we'll bring the scope back, and we'll continue to evaluate all of the areas. So we want to look, we want to look circumferentially around. We'll withdraw the scope. And again, I'm insufflating. I have my finger on the air insufflation as I do this to allow the colon to distend up as best we can. We want to make sure that our lens is clear as we do it. We're looking circumferential, and we'll withdraw the scope. So when a peristaltic wave comes like that, just pause, and the wave will pass, and the colon will distend back up. If you've lost any ground, you can always re-advance the scope back in, and you can continue to use torque and your left-right wheels to completely evaluate the mucosa. So here's an area where if we had any concern about whether there could be a small flat polyp underneath this uh, retained stool, we might irrigate and wash that off to allow us to see what's underneath. For the most part, small puddles like that don't necessarily have to be always aspirated. If you can clearly see the mucosa underneath, as we can in this case, and we can identify that there's no polyp, that's fine. If there are large areas of fluid in the colon and you're having a hard time evacuating them, another option is to change the patient's position and simply roll the fluid out of your way. So patient position changes can help you, not just with advancement of the scope, uh, but with uh, evaluation of the mucosa on the way back out. So here we're seeing some bluish discoloration of the wall of the colon, and this likely represents one of the flexures, either the hepatic flexure in this case, or the splenic flexure will commonly have that. So if we are identifying areas where we're coming towards a flexure, we want to make sure that as we're coming around a bend, we're keeping the inside turn as well into the field of view as possible to allow us to completely evaluate the mucosa on the inside turn. If at any point I'm concerned that I have not seen that thoroughly, I will advance the scope back in and we will torque to a different position and we will come back to allow ourselves to completely evaluate. There's another peristaltic wave. We'll simply hold the scope in position, let it pass, and then continue on with our evaluation. So again, here's a little ridge where I haven't quite seen over the top of it, and so I'll advance the scope back in, and we'll look down and under to assure ourselves that we're not missing a polyp uh, on that, uh, underneath that haustral fold. So again, here's an area where I did not get a very good evaluation underneath this haustral fold, so I'll come back. I'll put the scope tip very close. We'll look over that fold, and you can see that as I do that, as I come underneath that fold, there's the view under the fold. As I pull back, I've now blinded myself, but this is an area that I've actually evaluated. I can see that area, and now I've seen over the fold as well. You can see that small, small motions with the scope tip are really all that you need here to evaluate. So again, here's an entire area up top that I have not completely evaluated because of the position that I came at. So I will advance the scope back in. We will keep the portion that I did not evaluate now in the field of view, which is this entire upper section. And I've now evaluated that mucosa and I've identified no lesions. This is an inside bend right here. Again, we see some bluish discoloration, suggesting I'm probably at the splenic flexure this time. So the hard part to evaluate is going to be the inside bend. So I'm going to potentially have to come back through if I want to make sure that, and to say that at the 12 o'clock position here, that I've seen it thoroughly. We'll let the peristaltic wave pass. I'll do a thumb down maneuver, and there's the entire upper end of that bend 
now a bit more thoroughly evaluated. Here's an area where there are not as many house rule folds. And so you can go a little bit faster in these areas if you're getting if you have the lumen centered and you're getting a good evaluation, you don't have to uh, move back in and out as often. Keep the lumen centered as we come around what is likely the bend in the sigmoid colon here. Keep the lumen center. We're getting a few more haustral folds here, and so we want to make sure that we're looking and evaluating over the top of all of those. Looking on the inside bend here of all of those as well. On the right hand side of the screen is an area that I have not evaluated very well, so I will torque and I will do a thumb down as I pull back, and we'll look up inter intermittently and we'll be able to see around that bend that I was not seeing very thoroughly with uh, my earlier scope position. So as we're completing our colonoscopy to perform a complete exam and thoroughly evaluate all of the areas for mucosally based pathology, uh, it's important to perform a retroflex maneuver in the uh, rectum. That allows us to look at the very distal rectum and the beginning of the anal verge for any pathology. We would identify that first by identifying where we are distally in the colon, and there are several ways to do that. The first is to, as the scope is withdrawn, identify landmarks that tell you that you are in the rectum, and those would be uh, the, the valves uh, of the rectum. Uh, we can identify the valves. As we come distal, our endoscope distance markers become more um, uh, translatable into one-to-one -one position. While this is not a rigid scope, in the rectum, if you are at 10 centimeters, you are relatively close to 10 centimeters from the anal verge. Now, it's important that we look from the anal verge and not from where the, the, the gluteus is uh, because folks with uh, obesity or who have large gluteal uh, muscles, uh, the distance from the gluteus to the anal verge may be several centimeters. So we want to look directly from the anal verge. The final way to identify is on pullback as we get down toward the anal canal. We'll begin to see the internal hemorrhoidal cushions and you may be able to identify the location of the dentate line. Those are our anatomic landmarks. Once we see those, we're going to maximally insufflate so that the colon, uh, I'm sorry, so that the rectum is very distended with air. We're going to advance our scope in slowly, and at the same time as we advance the scope, we're going to do a full thumb down maneuver on the big wheel to place the scope in a very tight position. We are once again going to have paradoxical motion. As I want to move away from the anal verge, I'm going to push the scope in. As I want to move closer, I'm going to pull the scope toward myself. So here I'm going to pull closer to allow myself to evaluate the anal verge. Here we see areas of a hemorrhoidal cushion tightly around the scope. To evaluate thoroughly, we want to be able to torque clockwise and counterclockwise to again make sure that we are not missing any lesions that might be hidden uh, behind the endoscope itself. Once we've uh, completed that maneuver, uh, we will put the wheels back to a neutral position. We will slowly withdraw the scope we will look for any signs of trauma that may have been created on the wall of the colon if our retroflex was in a tight uh, rectum, and then we'll withdraw the scope and complete the exam. So now we're going to focus on scope navigation and mucosal evaluation in the upper GI tract. Uh, the way we hold the scope and the, and the maneuvering skills are all of the things we've already talked about. There are, there are not a lot of major differences uh, between doing an upper scope in terms of the maneuvering uh, uh, as with a colonoscopy. There are several different areas that we want to evaluate uh, more thoroughly with an upper scope than with a lower scope, uh, and so we'll talk about those here. So as we advance our scope in, we want to identify where the glottis is. The glottis is above me, and we want to go below. Those are the vocal cords. We want to stay below the vocal cords to enter the upper esophagus. So uh, we will evaluate from the esophagus, and with an upper scope, we tend to do a lot of the evaluation on the way in, as opposed to a colonoscopy where we do the majority of the evaluation on the way out. 
So here we are in the esophagus, and we will, just like we've talked about, we'll keep the lumen centered, and we will advance the scope down toward the GE junction. Uh, once we identify where the GE junction is, we will enter the stomach, and we will insufflate the stomach maximally. I like to evaluate the duodenum next before I do a complete evaluation of the stomach. That's just my personal preference. Uh, I will alter that if I find obvious pathology in the stomach that would preclude me from advancing the scope forward. But for the most part, we're going to advance the scope forward along the greater curve of the stomach. As I advance my scope, I try to keep the dependent portion, so the posterior portion of the stomach, in the downside of the screen here. And I try to keep the anterior gastric wall anterior. And that, that positioning helps me navigate. It also helps when it comes time to do procedures such as putting a feeding tube in like a percutaneous gastrostomy where orientation is a bit more important. As we advance the scope in though, I am going to torque a small amount and my scope is going to bow along the greater curve. I'm going to go to our map view here to show you a better view of what's going on. So this is the gastroscope which is positioned along the greater curve. And as I advance the scope in, you're going to see it sliding along the greater curve of the stomach. This is what's called a long scope position. It is distending the stomach up. This is a very, or can be a very uncomfortable position for the patient because of the amount of gastric stretch that you are uh, providing. So what we will do is, uh, this is my endoscopic view now, and I've actually advanced, I'm looking directly at the pylorus now. As we advance to the pylorus, the first thing that I want to do from this long scope position, once I get my scope through the pylorus, is to take a picture of the duodenal bulb. And I do this on the way in for the reason that I will show you in a minute. So here's our duodenal bulb. We can do a small amount of scope torque as well as use our wheels to look at the anterior and posterior wall to identify any disease processes, capture pictures, or take biopsies if necessary. I'm then going to advance the scope into the duodenum. And at this location of the duodenum, the typical maneuver that I tell my trainees is to Torque the scope with your left hand, turn the little wheel away, and then use the big wheel to reposition the scope in the midline. And here we can see the second portion of the duodenum now very clearly. The ampulla is located in the uh, five to six o'clock position here on the screen. We've now evaluated the second, uh, first and second portions of the duodenum and the duodenal bulb. As I withdraw the scope, let's go back to our map view here. Here is our scope in the second portion of the duodenum, still in a very long scope position. As I withdraw the scope, as I withdraw the scope, the scope is going to go into what we call a short scope position. You can see that the endoscope tip has not moved from the second portion of the duodenum, but rather this long loop that I have in the body of the stomach has reduced. This is essentially a short scope position where the scope is positioned along the lesser curve of the stomach. This is a much more comfortable position for the patient to be in. And so if you're going to spend a substantial amount of time in the duodenum, it's important to pull the scope back to a shorter position. This will increase the patient comfort. It will also allow you to translate torque a bit better to the scope, and it will reduce the narcotic requirements or the anesthetic requirements for the case. Let's go back now to our endoscopic view. Now that we are in a short scope position and that loop is entirely reduced, as I begin to withdraw the scope, you can see number one that I'm still reducing that a bit of a loop because the scope tip is not moving. But as I start coming back, this duodenal mucosa is going to move very quickly and it's much easier to evaluate this on the way in in a longer scope position than it is on the way out in a short scope position. And that's particularly true for the duodenal bulb, where as you pull back, the scope dramatically reduces. I'm well back into the stomach now. In fact, to see the pylorus, I have to advance in substantially here. And so I got a very poor view of the pylorus uh, and the duodenal bulb on the way back out. So we inspect that on the way in. Once I've come out, I will advance back to the pylorus and we will inspect for any pre-pyloric uh, lesions. I then do an aggressive thumb down maneuver and I advance the scope in a small amount. And that's going to allow me to partly retroflex and allow me to look at the entire greater curve side of the stomach here. Let's go back to our map view. And you can see that my scope tip is retroflexed 
and I'm looking at the entire lesser curve of the stomach here. And that's, again, a common spot where ulcers and pathology happen, and so we want to get a very good evaluation of that. From this position, I will torque. I'll do a full retroflex with both wheels, and I will inspect the majority of the stomach, actually, in retroflex position. And as I do, I will pull the scope back, continuing to torque all the way around, evaluating the mucosa. That's the greater curved side. We're torquing all the way around. There's the lesser curved side. We'll keep the stomach insufflated as we do this to allow us to thoroughly evaluate. We'll continue to pull the scope back all the way up. And now we are looking at the fundus. This is the fundus, where you'll have a fundic pool sometimes, a fluid that you may need to aspirate to see clearly, and the GE junction. And so on this patient, we can see that the GE junction is very wide open, suggesting that the patient has a hiatal hernia. But this is an important view, and again, this is one of those views that you want to document with a photo to show that you've looked at the uh, GE junction in retroflex. I'm going to undo my retroflex by putting my wheels toward a neutral position. I'll slowly withdraw my scope. That puts me back in an end-on view. And now we're back in a neutral position. And then I can continue the rest of my inspection of the stomach in a prograde view, again, looking for pathology. You want to insufflate again to sort of smooth out the rugal folds to allow you to better identify pathology. And then we will pull our scope back and evaluate. Now on the way in, we evaluated the majority of the esophagus. One of the areas that is generally not thoroughly evaluated on the way in is right at the level of the cricopharyngeus because as the scope is advanced in, the patient may be a bit uncomfortable. They may not have had enough sedation. It's a very stimulating part uh, of the uh, of GI tract to have a scope in. Toward the conclusion of the case, the patients are generally more comfortable. And as you bring the scope back out, as we get towards the 20 to 18 centimeter mark, we want to more thoroughly inspect the cricopharyngeus on the way out in a patient who is then very comfortable. And now we're back out at the uh, hypopharynx and the scope uh, procedure is done.